Welcome to the Colored Pages, folks. I'm Rebel Kazi. Hey, I forgot my name. I think it's Jabari. Bishop Bari. Bishop Bari. Black Bishop Bari. Can they read yeah. that? It's probably backwards. Yeah, we'll fix it right. when we edit it. <laughs> um, that's what they thought. We got a lot to talk about today. Today is going to be probably a fun episode. Maybe not that fun. Um, it's been really fun in planning. Um, it's taken a while to plan, and I'll talk about that when we... It's dense. The, yeah, it's dense. There's a lot of nuances, and we probably, and I guarantee you there's going to be blank spaces that we didn't fill, right? Right. But what the hell do you expect from two dudes sitting in a porch talking about this stuff? Well. The world. <laughs> um, but well, you want to start with some questions? Yeah, let me say this real fast. Wear a mask. I see a lot of y'all protesting. Look. Some of y'all wear glasses. Do they fog up sometimes? Yes, they do. But it's really not that bad. You're lying to yourselves when you tell yourselves that you're giving yourself hypoxia and all this crap. Then see, oh, I'm overdosing on my own CO2 by wearing the mask, but the mask doesn't work. Your mask is porous. Right. <laughs> you can get the oxygen in. Have you heard of waterboarding? <laughs> Water goes through the Right. If water can go through it, air can right. too. Right. And, and I, all right, I don't hold that on all cases. I don't know about that, but it's probably true. Well, no, it's true. The <laughs> air goes through, the carbon dioxide goes out, but the fabric of the mask is enough to keep yourself away from infectious droplets. So we know it's everywhere. If we wear masks, every other country that's implemented some sort of widespread mask policy has been able to curb the spread. So that's what we need to do. Wear the mask. All right. Sorry. We go into question time. And we have a good question, and it's the only question for today. Y'all be all right. Um, and in the future, we'll probably start more episodes like this where we take a question from the viewing audience. Maybe we could just do Instagram posts or something like that where we're literally just doing yeah, we could like do that responses too. to the episode. Something like that. We'll figure it out. Yeah. You guys can tell us what you want to see. Yeah. Um, so this one comes from Sage Brule, who asked. Um, What's is, up, bro? Yep. Go on, Sage. <laughs> Thanks for watching. He says, is theater support, as I'll coin the phrase, better than no support? Couldn't want to argue that if an entity like Nike makes a comment in support of Black Lives Matter, even if they may not wholeheartedly believe the comment, that they are doing much more good than evil for the world because their platform reaches so many people. And he says as a parallel, am I really doing anything for black lives by posting a black square? And Rebel, you had some thoughts when we were talking about that earlier, so you can go ahead. And I think you're gonna be more eloquent with it, but I'll give the, the gist of it. Okay. Uh, it's like, no pun intended, there's no black and white answer. And that was a very black and white question. Not that it's not a fair question to ask, because it really is, but it, it's complicated. Um, so yes and no, but also kind of not yes and also not no. Um, it, very briefly, it also depends. There's a lot of factors that go into it. And think of audience, right? Nike is talking to a lot of people, right? And you, I don't know, maybe seeing something like Kaeper, them supporting Kaepernick, right, is a huge move forward. And the people that consume Nike and will continue to consume, consume Nike well past, even if right, the owners or the leadership doesn't wholeheartedly believe it, the audience wholeheartedly is believing it or absorbing it, right? So th that odd, like Nike has that audience to do that. Whereas what if it were just one person doing it, what, and you guys have probably seen a lot of posts about this on Instagram and stuff, and Instagram stories, it's just quote unquote performative. And people talk about how like, oh, performative, like just posting the black square when you never were before is worse than, um, than just not have posting it at all. And that's where it goes, again, it gets a little more complicated because think about the audience. What if it's just somebody you know, right? They don't, they've never really cared about it. They've said all lives matter before, right? But they're seeing all people, like hashtag Black Lives Matter and then post the black square, right? That's definitely pernicious in, in the most, because of its just mere performative nature. And I get it, Nike's, in our example, Nike's would still be performative, right? But I feel like 
One is pushing the ball forward because it's reaching a real audience, whereas the other one is just putting up an image of yourself. And I guess the business is just putting up an image of itself as well. But that's where it becomes this real nuanced, not black and white answer. Yeah, um, you said I was going to be more eloquent with it. I don't know if I, I will be, but um, I think the question boils down to two kind of important relationships. So the first relationship I think it works is how systems work between ideals, spiritualism, that sort of thing, the ideals that we hold to be true, important, moral, and the systems, the actual policies, institutions, the practices that those ideals support, right? So when we talk about, think about the smallest example in politics. Whenever we propose a new policy, we don't just propose it out of thin air. We propose it because we've abstracted some sort of new value that we think is important to defend. Yeah. And vice versa, policy over time has this sort of inertial effect where, you know, the more and more people, for example, who are forced to uphold the Civil Rights Act will end up unconsciously subscribing to its tenets, the hope is, and avoiding discriminatory practices because that's the legal thing to do. And over time, they just assume without much thought that it's the right thing to do. So there's an interplay between our attitudes and dispositions and the policies that support or that are supported by those, uh, by those attitudes and vice versa. And so when we talk about, well, how much good am I doing by posting a black square? If you had asked me this question five months ago, I would have said absolutely nothing. But I think a lot of this quarantine period has brought me to a place of reflection where I'm greatly appreciative now of just how powerful our thoughts, our attitudes are, and how they sway not only public opinion, but how they make a difference in outcomes, even on a broad systemic level. So anything you can do to change the hearts and minds of people is not only good, but it's necessary because you can't get the wide, huge, what we call systemic change that we want without the base level shift. In it. Yeah, sorry about that. No, you're fine. So you have, to, you have to have one in order to get the other and having the policy can help shift the, the attitude. And I think the second part of the question, like, you know, should I be posting a black square if I don't? Um, you know, am I a racist? Am I a racist? If I do, am I being hypocritical? Well, I think that's our tendency to moralize racism, right? And make it, again, no pun intended, so black right. and white when it's so nuanced because of the ways in which it interplays in all different ways of living, right. thinking, and just being. Right. All right sorry. No, you're fine. It's just, it's, I think, yeah, you're exactly right. It's, this interplay where, you know, we moralize racism because there are things that we found abhorrent about it. Remember, racism isn't some, I, I use philosophical language, that's how I'm trained, sorry. Um, it, racism isn't just this a priori sort of pre-existent thing that we stumble upon when we're conducting some sort of deductive investigation of the world. Racism is something that we encounter in our everyday experience that was constructed post the fact of our existence. So as we lived our lives here in the United States, the system of racism was constructed. And now as we work to deconstruct it, we have to actively work and try some things and do things to try to bring them down. It's nothing that we can do independent of our experience. It's wholly experiential and that we encounter it in the world. We see it with our own eyes, we read about it, and we try things to bring it down. And so, I mean, people aren't, people, when we talk about racism, we've moralized it in that we've fi figured out that it's a crappy thing, that it's a bad thing, and now we're trying to take it down. And people, therefore, have a right to experience and see how bad it is and change and shift. If people, for example, post a black square on their Instagram, and they didn't in the past, or they wouldn't have in the past, or they've said things like all lives matter in the past, and now they've changed, they're within their right to do so. And we should be encouraging that because it's a yeah. sign of shift. And that's the only way we can get about change is 
Sometimes we're going to make mistakes, or we have made mistakes in the past, and the only way to redeem ourselves is through forward-looking action and doing things to make up for it in the present. There's nothing we can do about the past, but we can change the present. And so doing things like posting a black square, I think, can help in signifying to yourself and others that you've that you moved on the issue. I've already touched on the extent to which posting a black square might shift attitudes and why that's important. And I think even if it is slightly hypocritical, I mean, yeah, we could evaluate the morality of that, but in terms of the material good it will do for helping to fight racism, I think we greatly underappreciate that. Yeah. Uh, the system is upheld by attitudes, and I think people on the left, us, have a great tendency to just think about racism as a policy issue and dismiss the attitudes, but the attitudes are very important. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter. The attitudes and policies both have a mutual effect on each other. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And as you would put it, that's the Hegelian effect. Yeah. Is, and so I would probably put it as more of a... a, a it's not just that. It's, yeah. it's scale. It's just right. the way ideas exist in their right. own being. And so um, yeah. without, that, without that interplay, you're not going to defeat racism. I mean, you can look at infant mortality rates, for example. Is there, is there some policy out there actively discouraging white doctors to allow black babies to die at a far disproportionate rate compared no, to white women. Right. But there's an attitude of, well, black women can't really feel pain as sharply as white women do. And so if they're screaming out in pain, they're more likely to exaggerate or not. There might not be as big of a problem. And so that racist attitude, unconscious as it may be, seeps out into the behavior and now you have what could be described as a racist outcome because of an attitude. Yeah. So that seems like something policy related, but it's really just the attitude right. of the doctor acting within policy. Right. right. So anything um, we can yeah. do to communicate a change in attitude is important. Yeah. And I went on for a very long time. But yeah. yeah uh, I think this would be one. Sage, we'll come back to this on an Instagram post yeah. for you. But we'll actually record an Instagram post yeah. and like go a little deeper into this. Uh, but all right, so you want to give the, the, oh. the conclusion answer, the, give a conclusion uh, on, the, on, the, on Sage's question. Yeah, yes, poster black squares, that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah. It'd be nicer if you meant it. Yeah, it'd be great if you meant it. But and like you, you actually took actions thereafter to right. not be racist, you know, and also like you probably left your fraternity or sorority at U of R. Um, but you know what? If you don't do it, so be it. I mean, a step is a step. Right? A step is a step, exactly. So, yeah. um, not saying that we shouldn't ask for more. Right. Uh, but slice of bread is better than no slice of bread. Right. Um, all right, cool. cool. All right, let's move on. Uh, what are we talking about today, Bishop? Oh, Lord. I want to talk about capitalism, and I want to try to keep my summary of the topic brief because I just went on, I just preached with my talent. I just preached on Sage's question and I kind of feel bad for monopolizing the time a bit. So I think the, the, it took a while for us to boil down exactly what we wanted to talk about when we say capitalism. And, you know, I think it kind of went, we developed it through a series of kind of serious questions about it. Like we're, we're both, graduates were both moving on in life and it's like well we're at a stage where we have to start thinking about careers and we have to enter the proverbial rat race and there's quote unquote real world right which yeah, is a the, very the, strange term yeah. when you've been indoctrinated in the kind of thought that we've been yeah. indoctrinated in that and it's just strange because what are we not in the real world right like, that? like what You're am i in some in, novel you're exactly. always in the real world. By I just definition, you're always in the yeah. real world. But yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah. The, the, the thought is, I mean, I think we, we both will attest to at times feeling a degree of, you know, hesitancy. Do we really want to go into this rat race? And when we do, like, how, how much do we want to be involved? In, in the sense that do we want to constantly be chasing up the bottom dollar? Do we always want to... Do we always want to be looking for the next Lexus, the next iPod, or not iPod, Jesus Christ, the next Apple product? Con 
engaging in the kind of materialistic ethics that capitalism seems to encourage. And when we think about that point, the light bulb goes off. Is capitalism, by encouraging that kind of materialistic ethic, negative for our, or have a negative effect on our moral development? And to what extent, if that is true, does it hurt our democracy? And so I think that is, we take this big structure of capitalism. We think about all of the things that it's given us. We think about things like John Maynard Keynes' first line of the general theory on unemployment that was published in the heart of the Great Depression in 1935. It's the failure of classic economics is its failure to produce full employment. We just saw 32 percent decrease in the GDP. I think we can yeah. all relate to that. Is that it's the biggest percentage drop in GDP like in ever history. Okay. Right. In history. Okay. And it, it's failure to, to secure full employment and uh, the great inequality. I mean <laughs> that's exactly the context in which we're talking right now. Right, exactly. Um, so it's it was, I mean those words from 1935 were directly applicable here. So we think about capitalism on that level, but then we come all the way down to its general import on who we are as people. Because I think there's a tendency, and it was the tendency that Rebel and I talked about, we had to fight when discussing what exactly we wanted to talk about and present to you all today, is there's this way of critiquing our economics by analyzing along economic lines, where it's like, okay, here's capitalism. And we're like, okay, well, how can capitalism be tinkered? Well, we, we might want to do this policy or that policy. Well, is that policy good or bad? And then we say, well, let's look at the economic impact of this new economic policy. And in a sense, it kind of feels empty in that we're arguing in the circle. But I think the general sort of grist that we're working against is this desire to want to step outside economics altogether. And this feeling that capitalism has become this total system in which we've based our entire lives, the way we look at the world through the bottom dollar. Even the ways in which we operate in our political system right. through that same lens. Right. Not saying that that's how the Constitution was written and framed. Oh, there's, um, a, there's actually an argument that, that that is the reason. Maybe maybe it is. Not Nothing that I've read yeah. would make me believe that, but maybe it is. But at least in the ways we've developed it over the years. Right. Um, and have acted with it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And the ways in which, and it's exactly what Jabari is saying, when we try to talk about economics, we're stuck in this bubble of only being able to critique economics through the language of economics, right. which is really hard to do and usually just doesn't work because it get, it's like talking into a vacuum. It's right. like a Facebook argument. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> a Facebook argument. Well, well. But, uh. so at least in the world of academia and really in the world of the modern Black Lives Matter movement, like the Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement today, all of it is based on intersectionality and recognizing intersectionality. Mm -hmm. And that's like one of the biggest things in our discourse that the discourse itself doesn't talk about. Like your average person doesn't know what intersectionality is. They're right. like, I saw that. That's like Patterson and Perry. Right, that's an intersection. That's an intersection. That's an intersection. No, no, but yes and no. <laughs> Um, but it is inter like it's interdisciplinary and intersection. It's intersectionality. Yeah. Uh, like, so I head. think it's interdisciplinary too. As well, yeah, yeah. We're combining economics Subjects, is, and like, this right, is where I'm going. Right. So when we're trying to talk about an economic system, right? So we economic determinism is one of the biggest flaws in American political and just social discourse. Period. Because it rules out everything else. Um, What's the what like that's like saying oh bi a business owner should only drive towards profit right? right but what if your profiting practices are actually hurting people in your community and having bad outcomes and this is where the totality economic system is it's the next question within the economic discipline is well how is it hurting the other yeah. person well because it hurts their ability to function economically okay. and it's like well yes but no, the bigger concern is, no, it may just be hurting them on moral grounds. Human, yeah, moral, just human, human grounds. All, and so that's, we can't analyze that within economics. And we so I guess the second or third rather big claim then uh, to add on to Jabari's big claim about the, the moral, the negative effect 
that capitalism can have on more or extreme capitalism have on moral development is that in a modern age, what is it that Dave Chappelle said? New, new, new problems need new solutions. <laughs> one, problems, yeah, my, yeah. Problems. one of my favorite, one of my favorite skits ever. And, uh, was that the, yeah. uh, uh, the pop copy? Yeah, 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 I think so, I think so. I watched it yesterday, but I'm blanking again. But one of my favorite skits, but it's so true. And in regards to what we're talking about, so as we're critiquing capitalism, I urge you hard thinkers, to know that this is not Marxism. <laughs> none of the <laughs> that we're spitting, none of the is, is, is Marxism. We're not even using, while Marx may be the best critique on capitalism on economic lines, yeah, we're, going, we're going beyond that. So yeah. we don't even need to get to it because I'm not, I'm not dealing with being- well, I, wanna deal, I wanna deal with the distinction. Yeah. Like uh, there yeah, are ways yeah, yeah, yeah. to criticize yeah. uh, economics, capitalism, without referring yeah. to Marx. Yeah. You're right. Though he's he's been the he's best, the yeah, one. he's been the most salient one over time. Right. But the the claim that I'm making, and I guess that we're both making, is that because our modern society doesn't require an economic system, it requires a socio-economic political system. Even beyond right. that, a socio-economic political moral system right. that binds. That shit's hard, right. and it's hard to think about. But think think critically on that. Um, and we'll, we're, we'll try to guide, we'll, we'll try to get there. I wanna, um, yeah, yeah. I think that's perfect. It requires... Interdisciplinary, it. intersectional. Right. And so I want to talk about what that means. And so like, I've, I've spent a lot of time in preparing for this episode reading John Dewey. And John Dewey is someone who I think is a good, I won't say counter, because I don't think he's, I don't think he's outright against Marx, although I think they're philosophical nuances that are in sharp dissonance to some of the underpinnings of Marxist thought. So, uh, but he is a good counter, I guess he's a good counterweight, a good counterpart. So Dewey is raised in the surprise, the pragmatic tradition. Anyone who knows me knows I'm obsessed with pragmatism. Um, has not shut up about it for the past at least four years. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. Shout out John Schwartz who made me read all that. But anyway, Joshua Schwartz, sorry. Um, so Dewey was raised, though, in his early years as a Hegelian. And so, like, for, for those of you who are like, who are all these names? What the hell is that? And so Hegel is considered, like, the big grandfather of post-Kantian German thought. So after Kant is, like, we come into this era of transcendental idealism, we have Hegel. And then from Hegel, we have Marx. And a, a lot of the American students, John Dewey was an American, were indoctrinated in that Hegelian way of thought because Hegel was like the thing. He was it for a good amount of time. And so like Dewey is raised. That was that scaring thing. capitalists actually. Right. It and was. he wasn't even anti-capitalist necessarily. Right. Maybe. I not I haven't read enough I think to he, say that. No, I mean but Hegel, maybe Hegel Hegel is scary because of some of his political thought that has nothing to do with the critique of capitalism. That's my thought. I don't know anything but, about this, so that's beyond the subject yeah. of today. But the point is, it's like, so both Marx and Dewey talk about the idea of discourse, which you guys hear us say a lot. It's, you know, the impact basically of, you know, one thought or reflection upon another. That's Can I give an point. example? Yeah. Example, all right? We're talking about it, political discourse. Right. It would be an example, right? It's the talking points, and we all are very cognizant of these talking points. All right, when I say pro-life, you think Republican Party. Right. When I say pro-choice, you're thinking Democratic Party. All right, that's discourse right in there. There's already a bubble constructed with language picked right. out for you right. that they all talk about. You know what right. I mean? Right. Um, they, they'll talk about what? Uh, fetus, embryo, when right. does life begin? All of that operates within... Uh, that 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 that's discourse. Right. That's a good way to kind of get me out of this long, boring lecture. So let's think about that bubble. And instead of pro-life, let's not do that one. No. States' rights. No. <laughs> no. This has to do with the economics point. So okay. let's think about. <laughs> yeah, states' right. Uh, let's think about like that bubble. But instead of like pro-life, let's think about okay. Let's think about individualism. So, so first collectivism. Exactly. Back. Another discourse. That's you saw how I just went to that right. because I've been. I right. guess socialized within within the discourse. Right. 
So the discourse kind of goes from the Dewey perspective. And he lays it out, I think, kind of clumsily and exhaustively, but decently, how we start out from individualism based on how we're raised, how we're socialized in America. From our inception out of the Enlightenment era, there's a huge emphasis on individual rights. And the individualism of, that comes from this idea of being innately touched by God or having something unique about us that warrants respect and, and brings with it some in, un, inalienable rights, right? We take that idea of individualism and then we apply it to the economic system or the need for economics, which is how we provide for ourselves materially, right? So obviously we have basic physical needs. We need certain physical, natural resources. We need things like food. We need things like shelter. And so the individualism that was assumed because of our, our social constraints was combined with our economic need to produce sort of these, I guess, to use the Hegelian uh, language, these sort of theses of ideals that come to be in our modern day. The assumption that if you make the money, you get to keep it. The idea that uh, 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 of private property comes from the combination of individualism and then using our assumptions about individualism to empower people. About ownership, or, or uh, I guess rather about just something uh, material. Right, like, yeah, yeah. right. To empower people to go out. Or our relationship people. towards that material, right. then, rather. Yeah. Right, and then, you know, there's... And, that's a whole nother theory about the, the theory of value, you know, the Lockean theory. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Theory. And that's right. We're not talking about capital here. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but anyway, it's hard. It's, it's yeah. Talk about things. If you talk, if you say anybody who reads Marx is dumb and like idiotic, <laughs> you, you think, try to read it. Just, just, just try to make sense. That's hard to read. <laughs> so <laughs> hard to read. Right. So Speaking like, in tongues. Well, you're kind of behind me. Yeah. I feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> get, get ready to preach it this time. Come on now. It's fine. It's fine in this Presbyterian church. So we have in this discourse, we have you know, ideals that you've heard expressed about private property, about ownership, about that's out of which libertarianism might come. There's this stress on individual rights and out of that property rights, out of that, you know, prohibitions against any form of taxation, yeah. right? Because it's yours. And so Dewey wants to say, okay, so we've developed the individualism, which helped us to prop up our economy. But the problem he says is our economy, our ability to provide for our basic needs has come from things like machines, has come from things like science. Science, and this is where the philosophy comes in, the epistemology comes in, is a communal effort. So he says the big, I guess, conflict doesn't come between the classes, and this is how he's different from Marx. The big conflict doesn't come from, uh, you know, classes meaning classes. It's how we get our material needs met through a community activity like science combining that with the ethos of individualism we have science which has given us the machines the technology to be able to make things that secure us to make houses to provide for food and distribute it on a massive scale think about all of the interconnections that we have with roads and bridges and the internet and the computer. But even those were constructed within those ethos right. of individualism. Right. Think of the interstate system. Right. The interstate system was created not for public transportation's purposes. Right. It was created for right. private, right. individual transportation. Right. But, um, but how do we get to those roads? It took a collective, collective. Yeah, yeah, community absolutely. effort. And so it took a Republican president right. who taxed right. people the most right. out of any president before and yeah. Right, exactly. Well, that's right. And who used state power more than add presidents after him used probably a right. little more state power. But used a lot of state power. Right. And tax rates were at around 90% or the marginal rate, top marginal rate was at around 90% yeah. on top earners. 
So like that was a community effort to build those roads, to give us the conveniences of modern life. But how are, how are, the, good, how are the goods of, those, of that system distributed? They're distributed based on the ethos of individualism. Yeah. We have a giant system. Think about Amazon. All of the things, all of the people who have a hand in making sure that you can order something on Tuesday and get it by Thursday. But who gets the lion's share of the profit? The entity Amazon and then Jeff Bezos. All of the people who were involved, they get pissed off. They get $11 an hour. But Jeff Bezos and the entity of Amazon can reap a lot of the benefits of being able to do that. So it's a clash in the different ideals more so than the clash in the uh, classes that produce this, this problem with capitalism. And that's the distinction, I think, between Dewey and Marx. And it gives us a way of criticizing capitalism without going full-blown yeah. Marxist. And I also think when we say it's a problem with cap- capitalism, we need to be a little bit more clear. It's a problem because of the dissonance within it. It's like, and we can't get too much in a haven. We always end up just because pulling both, ourselves. Because we're, we're both communal philosophers. Okay, there we go. Um, so, I don't know. I don't really even know what that means because I, I didn't study philosophy in college. But apparently, I think about it a lot, we're kind of a lot. Um, and I've been exposed shout to it. Shout out obvious, shout out Cam. But we always keep coming back to this, but it's this dissonance that is causing the tension we see today. Like, it, it's not just racial divide. It's even deeper into the inception of the systems in which we are participants and drivers of. Like, without us as actors, what economy would exist? Right. None. There would literally be none. The market only exists so far as people operate it, right? Right. I know that is a very obvious point. It's a truism. It's it's a truism, but you need to understand that to understand the system itself. Right. And to understand, I guess, back to the claim, Mm -hmm. is that we need a socioeconomic, political, moral system, and you could keep adding on more. So let me let me connect your ultimate point back to Dewey. I'm gonna finish the transition so it all makes sense in a circle. So if we have a knowledge base, and he uses the word science because science to him, regards to some knowledge base, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Because science to him and science to Hegel, by the way, notice the big word that comes up in the phenomenology a lot isn't philosophy, it isn't metaphysics, it's, it's science. science. Yeah. Because it's a community endeavor. I think Foucault even right. talks a lot about the science. Exactly. Yeah. Because oh, yeah, yeah. All right, keep going. No, keep going you're right. Because it's, I have a hypothesis, I go out and test it. You test my hypothesis, you figure out it's wrong, and so on, and that's the discourse, right? Yeah, and it reiterates until we come up with a conclusion that works, and more people can test and figure out, and so on and so forth. It helps us to come up with conclusions that help us to live our lives yeah. more effectively. And that does, yeah. and I can't do science by myself. I need you to help me. I need other people to help me. And so it's a community endeavor. So the so our material needs are met not through the profit motive. They're met through a social construction, for lack of a better word, of science. Yeah. But the gains of buzz that one social construction of science. Maybe that'll be an episode yeah, if we can a, get a. No, that's because we cause, get a good. We have a lot of science friends that are doing PhDs and stuff like that. We could get yeah. them in here to and help and your deconstruct boy, that. Foucault has a lot. To say a lot. About oh, that. oh, so a lot much to say about that. that. So much. So we have, the, and I don't really. That's. And it's hard for me to understand. It, yeah. Like, talk about Foucault. I, yeah. I'm still working on. It, yeah. But no, I mean, I, we're I, we're I, a work I, in I, progress. Yes. Like we said, there might be loophole or blank spaces. Right. Help us fill in the gaps. Right. right keep going. So we have the gains from the social con- construction of science, and then out of those gains, we distribute those gains along individual levels, as we just mentioned. So we need a socio-political economic system to socialize the gains that were begotten by socialized means. So in other words, if the knowledge or the system of science is social and that everyone has to participate in order to make it work, doesn't it stand to reason that the things that we get from it, the material, the basis for our ability to exist here on earth, shouldn't that be socialized too? in the sense that everybody who contributes in the, in the scientific work of producing our goods should now have a fair, just enough share 
of the gains that come from that system. And so we need a bit of redistribution along social lines to allow people to live, have enough, the doctrine of enough from Frankfurt. I don't want to go into that. It's even, it's even so political they, theory in America, freedom right, from want. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that we can then exist socially, which is, I think, a, the answer to our big question. Like, why is capitalism bad for our moral development? Because there are too many people who are in want to be able to be free from it and engage socially. You can't engage socially if you're too busy trying to pay the bills, working three jobs, trying to take care of your kids, and you can barely do that. You can't engage socially if you're too fat on your own individual perspective and individual gains. In your that, individual economic class position. Right, that you can't engage with other people. And that goes for, and not, that's not just in regards to the, like Jeff Bezos of the world. That's right. also lower class people who are stuck in that same type of- That, uh, that mindset. That mindset. And so we need to socialize, I think Dewey might be comfortable saying, the, the gains from our scientific endeavors so that we all can have enough so that we can be free to come together in this social way where we're all engaging and we don't have to worry about our basic necessities being met. Yeah. We can come together in a communal aspect and we can all be more or less equal in power as we come up with our policies and as we engage in our politics. But we can't get there if we keep on combining of uh, this social endeavor of science with the individual way in which the goods of science are distributed. And that people, in that we have the disproportionate distribution of wealth and that there's still people who are living in too much poverty to be able to engage with one another. They can't go out and vote. They can't go to town halls. And why can't they, they go can't out share. to vote, right? Not just because the leg their state legislatures are taking out the voting polls near their areas, right. assuming they even have transportation to get there. Right. But you think you're caring about voting when you still have to work your wage job, right. hourly job, right. at minimum wage, and then go on to your next job and back to your family, and you have responsibilities there. Right. It doesn't work that way. Right. And to even assume that, I remember a few years ago, and this is where it takes on that human aspect. Right. And I think it's really important that we keep trying to boil it back down to really harp at that point where right. we need that interdisciplinary system, right. intersectional system. It's there's there's that story about the woman, I forget where, this was a few years ago, at, I think five years ago, four or five years ago, she uh, she died from heat exhaustion in her car from taking a nap in between one of her three jobs. Mm. And if that doesn't strike you somewhere, right. you've probably never had to work a day. Right. Um, because if she has a right to participate, but she can't participate if she doesn't have her fair share. We hear that yeah. word a lot. That's she actually doesn't have enough. That's actually the you know I you asked me two years ago about universal basic income. This is obviously a tangent. You asked me a few years ago about universal basic income. I would have been like, eh, that's a hard thing. I don't know morally necessarily how we can talk about that. Um, and then when I was doing my senior seminar um, on republicanism, so not as in the party, small as in, yeah, small r, so as in the system of politics in which we operate today. We say democracy, but really what we're saying, yeah, we're talking about a republic. Um, and that's just how modern discourse is. Mm -hmm. But when I was talk taking that class, uh, I was exposed to the idea of universal basic income as preserving liberty. And when I, like, I... I swear, when I read that, something struck in my cord. And that was like one of those things where, damn, you, taught, you broke the system down. You deconstructed it for me to see it in a different way. So you're talking about an economic policy, universal basic income, and you talked about it in the frame of liberty, not in an economic language. Right. Not, and that's when, I'm not going to say I was 100% about it, but I was like, oh, damn, this is something that we actually, this is a way, this is a topic that needs to be in American political discourse. And the fact that it isn't kind of, it right. shows that I, I guess our skewed right. percepti uh, perception of, uh, of liberty. Right. And this, for anybody interested, it's, uh, I think this was from Philip Pettit, 
from his book Just Freedom. Yeah, that sounds right. Where he is talking about liberty as non-domination, right. which we will not get into if y'all want to that a different episode. Yeah. Put it in the comments. Yeah, that might be. No, I think that's perfect. So when we talk about this social, political, economic system, we have to have some degree of fair distribution. I've touched on that enough. And with the fair distribution of, 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 of wealth, everyone gets a part to share with one another, not just things, but they get to participate. They get to come together in social groups without you know, the fear of having to sacrifice any material yeah. resources that they might have to be working toward. And so with that sharing comes the economic development, or the, the excuse me, the moral development. Yeah. And that's the way in which capitalism might be hurting our moral development, is everyone's so worried about the bottom dollar that they cannot escape that economic circle in practice, because they're so busy focusing with and operating within that sphere, because they have to to make ends meet. They yeah. can't worry about their neighbor. If they're too busy worried about themselves, they can't worry about our politics. If they're too busy worried about- Again, that dissonance between individualism and collectivism right. within economic terms. Right, yeah. so the, the, we have- the, Didn't the Bible say love thy neighbor? Right, but how can I love my neighbor as effectively as I can if I'm worried, well, I'm gonna get evicted next week. And shout out to the eviction crisis that's going to happen. If things don't change as they are. Yeah, rent's already ridiculous right. everywhere in this country. Right. Um, with no and real if you change don't recognize income, that, you've probably never had to run. Right. <laughs> and with no real change in income to help people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, literally, base income's basically been like this cost of living right. in, as whole. But if you really just look at housing prices like this, right. um, yeah, it's, it's. And I guess, again, back to everything, how do we change this, right? And that's the. I guess that's like one of the things old heads love asking us and pestering us. It's like, oh, you believe this? How are you going to change it? Right. I was like, well, we just said it. We just said it. It's not that ambitious, for real. Because you saw how simply we're able to talk about it. We All, distribute the wealth. Not, no, not even just that. <laughs> but look, we stepped outside of the economic language to talk about economic phenomena. Right. Right? Or economic realities, right. rather. I think that's a better way of phrasing so, it. Yeah, yeah. And that's a step. How do, so how do we change it? We already just showed you a way. Where that is going to go policy-wise, obviously, isn't up to us to. Right. We're going to be at the ballots regardless right. every single time because that's the type of things we value. But if we are lucky enough and privileged enough to have access to safely uh, for now. Knock right. on wood. Only that wood. <laughs> There's no wood. <laughs> um, yeah, so to the old heads watching, that's... That's how we break things down. When right. you break things down, we're able to look. Now, uh, so you were just talking about, I guess, we're, I guess we're really just focused on that living wage then, right? Well, the living wage and the ability for people to have enough. And I got that idea, the doctrine again of enough from Harry Frank, where he writes a book on inequality, where he basically talks about the problem of inequality isn't, oh, things are unequal. It's with inequality comes the inability for a lot of people down at the bottom of the totem pole to have enough. Yeah. And we need people to have enough so that they can participate socially, so that we can develop morally, because morality in a practical sense, and our ability to practice it, comes about through social yeah. engagement. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, that's spot on. So, I mean, that's, that's, I, I feel that's, like, that's, the, that's the line. I feel like that was like a very dense work through from like, because I, I want to stress this enough. Like you said at the beginning, I'm not a Marxist. You're yeah, not I'm not Marxist. really. I'm not like, I've read a lot of Marx. Right. Have I understood everything? Probably not. But, I'm a human and I'm right. learning. You know what I mean? I'm not learned. I'm learning. Right. Um, and I hope we come off that way in this podcast right. as well. We're not learned people I mean, to some degree i guess learn but right. learning still through this discourse right because this just all right the conversation itself that we're having now took what four different meetings right to actually even get to you right exactly because it's like that's our big problem is we're not developed morally because we're so entrenched in this economic circle we're young adults we have to go into the workplace 
and it feels meaningless. And I feel like a lot of, you know, I refer to it as like the moral rock that's kind of at the center of our country right now comes from this place of inequality where everyone is striving for theirs because they need theirs in order to survive. And they can't ever step outside of that paradigm of needing to get theirs to engage socially and develop morally because the resources are there in that we have a system that's produced the biggest wealth GDP wise in the human history, but it isn't distributed to everybody. Look at per capita. We love right. bringing up per capita but income, per, but per, per capita, capita assumes growing. equality. Right. <laughs> so right. you can't, and, and the same right. people that preach per capita, uh, GDP per capita, right. are the same people being, uh, or talking about, oh, redistribution of wealth is terrible. You're a commie, right. you're a this. Right. Yeah, um, 100%, 100%. But, but if, you can, if you can assure that people have enough, then we, we don't have this, and conservatives love talking about the moral rod. Yeah. And the moral rod is there not because people- Some religious- Right. It's not, it's, it's not religious. It's because- It has some sort of spiritual essence. I 100% I agree, but I don't know if it's necessarily a religious one more so than it is some ethos of identity within um, being a country itself. Because in having a country, there are also identities constructed within it and for it that are used to prop up the ruling class and keep down the ruled class. Right. Uh, I think it was really powerful the way you just mentioned, we're young adults <laughs> and right. then moved on. But uh, my junior year of college, there was a professor from Chile. He, I forget what, what university he was teaching at. Um, but so he came to visit one of my classes that I was taking. He gave a speech um, and I literally remember walking out of this class in tears, struggling to find the meaning of life when he said, we live in this world where students don't go to universities to become better, more enlightened, or just learn. Right. They go to universities to get a job. Right. You know, and regardless, regard, I, I'm one of those people that said I did not go to university to get a job. <laughs> but <laughs> neither did first I. First thing, yeah, near graduation, graduation I'm freaking graduate. out. Yeah, exactly. And so here we are on a podcast. And we can't. And I think that's <laughs> why the capitalism thing like resonated with us. And that's like the beauty of having the conversation. It's like we have these questions that are there, but we can't express them mm -hmm. until we work our way through the discourse. That's our. If you're playing a drinking game. Every time we say discourse, <laughs> this you would be a great. You would be. Do up. not get behind the wheel. <laughs> if you go outside, wear your mask. <laughs> well, you better put this down. Because, but like that's the power of the conversation. And that's why, like, going full circle to the sage's point, conversation starts. The black square, the 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 Nike campaign. Those things are important because that's how we get to the heart of these big questions yeah. and controversies. Because there are questions that we have that we don't even know are there, so to yeah. speak. Because we're not at that depth of understanding to be able to ask them yet. And it goes even further to stuff that we kind of hint at right. in our first episode. But we're in the information era where we're presented with so much of this inf information and then we don't digest it. Right. You know what I mean? Digest it. Absorbing information or I guess thinking critically takes time. There's like nobody can think critically like that. If you did, you you just think it hard. You right. know? Um it, it takes time. Right. It takes a lot of time and effort and being wrong. A lot. It takes and being okay with yeah, being and being wrong. okay with being wrong and just being able to admit it. And I know all of you guys on Facebook love to preach that, but well, you don't you don't act. Well, Sorry, I'm, well, I'm off Facebook, guys. I'm off Facebook. That's that's official. Well, I'm off. well Jabari Jabari can handle promotion on that front. I'll try on Instagram. Well, even though they're owned by Facebook. Well, but I'll, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook by Facebook. <laughs> Facebook, by Facebook. <laughs> I'm not on that. Well, um, yeah, I, we hit everything, man. Yeah, that well, that went full circle. That was it. That yeah. went full circle. You have to start the conversations to get at those questions so that you yeah. can better understand them and feel more fulfilled. Like, now we know. if we The problem with capitalism, yeah, I mean, it hurts people in an economic sense, but it hurts them in a moral sense in that 
if things are unequal, and they are very unequal right now, it takes away the Not just economically. Right. But they're unequal in the sense that it robs people from being able to step, to take their lives outside of economic considerations, to live a social life, to live a moral life. And that's why we see rampant selfishness. That's why we see the people who refuse to wear the mask, because they're conditioned within this individualist ethos and have not been challenged to step outside. PDT, man. President Donald Trump. Well, PDT. 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 Not to like, oh, I want to hate <laughs> you. Pretty young thing. <laughs> Pretty young thing. And not the Wale version either. Give me some Haiti. Yeah. Well, PDT. I think that's a good point. He needs some moral moral teaching. Maybe he should read some Dewey. Well, I mean, ain't God good? Man, God's great. You got some of God on top. Well, God on top. God on top. Well, uh-oh. I feel the whole I'm kind of behind that. That's what's the Holy Spirit. Well, well. <laughs> You got something else I, you want to say? I really don't. I, I, I'm at loss for words because, for real, this went better than I really anticipated. This was a big endeavor for us. Yeah. Because, and maybe this will make the podcast or not, but whatever. Um, you can cut it out if you want. <laughs> this was a big endeavor for us in trying to talk about this because we actually had a date planned a week ago actually, right. over a week ago to record it right jabari said i'm not ready yeah. and i said and eh, i'm probably not either if you're not ready yeah. like it doesn't help to freshen up more right. but even when we freshened up we're still a little eh. right but things come together when exactly. you when you work through it together right you're not arguing on facebook i challenge our viewers no facebook posts Con- and my my, my partner no, no Facebook post. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But no comments. Yeah. Um, try to get set up a call and talk about it. Yeah, the call calling is better. Try to set up a call. Um, only thing else I'd like to add is next up, next episode, we haven't necessarily planned it out, but we definitely want a guest yeah. for next episode so you don't have to hear just us talking. There'll be some more colors to the color pages. They won't just be two pages. They'll be more pages well, um so yeah let us know what you guys want us to talk about what you don't want us to talk about um not that that's going to make any much of a difference as to what we will end up deciding well, to talk about I mean, we got a perspective but it is our show yeah exactly your own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well i guess that's it so we gotta stay worthy stay nerdy and keep our pages going rice it Rest, ice, compressed, and elevate.